If you're looking for a grow light that won't let you down but will look stylish in your home, then Soltec Solutions is your solution. Soltec Solutions' fabulous customer service means you won't be left in the dark when it comes to buying great grow lights. Choose from their range of track lights, pendant star lights, or a simple bulb that will screw into most standard light fittings for setup that takes just moments. Check out Soltec Solutions' range of lights now at soltecsolutions.com and get 15% off with the code on the ledge. That's soltechsolutions.com and enter code on the ledge for 15% off now. Chlorophyll filled felicitations to one and all. I'm Jane Perone. This is On The Ledge. Let's go! In this week's show, I chat to Avery Rowe about all things Tradescantia. And I answer a question about baby saxophrages. A warm welcome to the show with a particular hat tip in the direction of Janny, Mercy, Haley, Rachel and Ryan, who all became patrons this week. If you want to find out more about supporting On The Ledge every month, check the show notes for details. Tradescantias, we all grow them, we all love them, but sometimes it's not that easy to make them look their best and there's often a lot of confusion around which one is which. And that's what we're going to tackle in today's show with guest Avery Rowe, who is a real expert in the houseplant species and cultivars of this genus. Just a quick note before we get into that interview. Tradescantias have many common names. I tend to call them Tradescantias, <laughs> which works, but you might also see them named as inch plants, spiderwort, zebra plant or wandering dude. In France, the plant is called misère, which means misery. (laughs) Read into that what you will. But there is one common name that is often used for this plant, similar to wandering dude, that you won't hear on On The Ledge podcast. It's a bigoted term for the plant, which has no place in the 21st century. So I just wanted to clarify that before we got going, if you're confused about why that isn't mentioned in the show. I'll link to a couple of articles that explain this if you want to go deeper and find out more about why more and more nurseries and plant shops are dropping that name. With that out of the way, let's crack on with my interview with Avery. If you've ever wondered why your Tradescantia is distressingly leggy, I'm glad to say Avery's got the answer. My name is Avery Rowe and I'm a researcher and collector of Tradescantia plants and the Comodonaceae family generally. I'm also the cultivar registration authority for the Tradescantia genus. Can I just praise you for a minute, Avery? I have to say your website and the posts that you put on there are, I think, one of the best resources on the internet. It's just outstanding the work you're doing. So if I may just praise you at the beginning, I'm really glad to have you on the show because I'm always trying to counter the kind of poor information that's out there. And I think you might be able to sort out a few a few issues with this particular genus. Wow, thank you. (laughs) What a compliment. There are a lot of issues going on, and I guess this is the meat of your work, trying to figure this stuff out. But let's start from the very beginning, the Tradescantia genus. This is a genus that's been popular for houseplants for forever, but I don't know a great deal about their wild nature and how that translates to to them as indoor plants. Can you fill us in on that? So uh, Tradescantia is a genus of currently about 85 species, and it's quite a large and varied genus. Historically, it's been divided up into more separate genera, but 
there's recently has been more of a move to combining them. So there's a lot of variation within it. The genus is native to the Americas exclusively. And there's a combination of some temperate plants, which are native to like North America, which are popular grown as um, garden plants. And if you know them as house plants, you might not even recognize those garden types because they seem very different, they're perennials. Um, and then there are a lot of uh, tender tropical species that are native to Central and Southern America. They grow in places like um, kind of forest floors and along rivers and some in more kind of dry, deserty places. So again, still quite a lot of variation. And those are generally sort of vines and creepers. Um, and those are the ones that people tend to know of as houseplants. When were we first starting to grow Tradescantia as a houseplant? When, when did were they sort of started to be to be given scientific names? From like the research that I've done so far, which is, you know, not not complete by any means, most of these sort of tropical species came into cultivation generally in the like 1800s, um, some a little bit before then, but um, more since then. And there's quite a few species that have only been introduced in the 1900s. Um, so although they seem like very sort of old house plants, I think compared to cultivated plants in general, they're comparatively fairly recent, some of them. Yeah, that's interesting. I guess like so many plants came into cultivation in the 1800s, didn't they? It's like a mass rush. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's, I mean, obviously still a few more um, being added to the list. What made you choose to focus on Tradescantias? What was it that uh, particularly about that genus that drew you in? I'm not really sure. I, I sort of, I was just kind of get got into houseplants generally, you know, like everyone did <laughs> a few years ago. Um and sort of got a few Tradescantias. And as I was kind of reading up about them, I found that there was there were lots of different kind of cultivars that people were growing. I think personality wise, I have a tendency towards being a sort of a collector. So just that aspect kind of appealed to me. And then also, as I was learning about the different cultivars that there were, I found that there was a lot of uh, confusion and mis misinformation, misidentification and that kind of stuff also really appeals to me because I love kind of learning and research and sharing information. So I sort of got interested in clearing up confusion and, and explaining things. And, and so it just kind of spiralled, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things I learned from your website, Tradescantia Hub, is that there are five subgenera in this genus. Is there one of those that's particularly um, full of all the houseplant species? They're spread across sort of a couple of them. One of the most common houseplant subgenera is uh, Ostro tradescantia, and that contains um, Tradescantia fluminensis, which is one of the most common um, houseplant species. Campelia, which is the one that contains Tradescantia zebrina. They're not kind of evenly distributed over all the subgenera because there's one that's kind of just the temperate species, so there's no, no, no houseplants in there. Of the 85 species, there's only really a handful that are common as houseplants. Most of them are quite sort of unfamiliar. Moving on to sort of Tradescantia as houseplants, they're very, very popular. But I always think that sometimes they're not the plants that necessarily grow successfully for everybody some you know you uh, I'll often see that really spindly tradescantia looking really sad on a window ledge where are we going wrong with these plants how do we get these beautiful full plants that you know we, we desire yeah it's tricky because I would I would call tradescantias easy to grow house plants but the issue is that I guess they're a bit similar to you know succulents or something like that they're like they're easy to grow if you do the right things but you have to treat them a bit differently than some other houseplants. So you have to kind of know a few basics in order to get it right. And there's a few main things that you need to think of. So one of them is that Tradescantias are semi-succulents, which a lot of people don't realise because they look, they just look like kind of typical leafy tropical plants, but they're actually very drought tolerant and less tolerant of overwatering than you might expect. So a, a kind of a good first principle is to water them less than you think you should, and they will they will generally do fine. Um, so like you should basically wait until the soil is pretty much dry and then drench it, similar to the way you would for a succulent. And then the second sort of big thing that people have trouble with is that they they grow really fast. And because of their natural growth habit is that they tend to be sort of creeping, sprawling plants. So in the wild, they kind of spread along the floor 
and they kind of crawl along, putting roots down everywhere their stem touches. So they're not designed to go vertically upwards and they're not designed to trail downwards. They're designed to kind of spread outwards. But obviously in a pot, that's not really possible. So when they stay confined to a pot, they will end up trailing and that's not what they like to do. So they will gradually lose the leaves that are closer to the soil. The stems will become brittle and they'll eventually start to just break off in chunks. And that's kind of a natural adaptation when they do that in the wild, that's how they propagate and spread themselves. So like the plant doesn't mind doing that, but obviously if you're keeping it in a pot, it might not be what you want it to do. This is so interesting because this is so similar to what I've been uh, writing about in my when I'm writing this book. And there are so many trailing plants this applies to that actually they don't really want to trail. <laughs> no plant is really designed to trail, is it? Like that, why would a plant ever want to do that? There's no reason. So it's like it's a kind of an artificial thing that we impose on plants that actually just want to crawl along the floor. Yeah, exactly. It's so interesting. So yeah, the the way to sort of prevent that that look that you're probably familiar with where it looks really bare on the pot and then there's these leaves kind of hanging down below it is that you just need to prune them strictly and frequently. So like you need to stop the stems from ever getting that long, basically. And what you can also do is when you prune it, you can stick the cuttings straight back in the soil because one of the great unique things about Charles Gantis is that they are just ridiculously easy to propagate like laughably easy you can chuck a bit of broken stem on the floor and it will just make roots and grow you know um so you can yeah so the best way to maintain a happy bushy looking Travis Gantia in a pot is to prune it frequently and keep sticking the cuttings back in the pot yeah that is really good advice and i you know you've just seen so many pictures of sad looking tradescantias that <laughs> you just think oh they need some help yeah yeah and people assign all kinds of reasons to that look as well some people say oh they hate being watered from above which is you know not true some people say oh, it means there's not enough sunlight coming to the top of the pot which is also not true it's like this is just entirely to do with the way that they naturally grow there's there's no type of care can change that they are not designed to grow long vines with a single point of attachment to the soil. They must be quite adaptable because they are so popular and they can survive in all kinds of places. How much light can they take? Yeah, so that's one of the things that varies a fair bit between different species and different cultivars. Um, so there are some that that really need like as much sun as you can possibly give. So like Tradescantia pallida, which is uh, the most common cultivar is purpurea, which is the really bright purple one that you might sort of be familiar with. That one needs like tons and tons of light to get the best colour, really. And if it's if you keep it in a shady place, it will be really sort of pasty, pale, kind of greyish green with these long noodly stems and just look really sad. Um, ze zebrinas are among the most kind of uh, adaptable to light levels. So like if you, you can put them in like, full south facing sun in the uk and they will look really good you know they'll have like super super bright colors they'll go really red and purple but they can also do well in kind of more shady indirect light and they will still they'll still do okay you know they'll look a bit different they'll look a bit more greenish in color but they'll grow fine um, and then the sort of tradescantia fluminensis and mandula and the kind of related cultivars from that group they tend to do best in like not so much really bright sun so they, they're good for shade and they will do fine in kind of more indirect indoor light so there's like there's a, a big range really what about substrate we haven't mentioned substrate i mean people mm. grow these in all kinds <laughs> i mean they're i've seen so, people ones going yeah. in garden soil and all sorts oh yeah yeah i mean the, the reason i haven't mentioned substrate is because they basically they don't care they will grow in, <laughs> okay. they will grow in anything you can chuck them on the floor and they'll grow yeah <laughs> and people people grow them in yeah people grow them in hydroponics and lecker and um you can use like succulent soil or aroid soil or just whatever potting compost you have and basically they'll be fine oh great well that's good to know are they like cacti and succulents in that they're not a uh, heavy feeders it's hard to say i think that i think yeah that they're, they're not sort of super heavy feeders but like like any plants they will benefit from you know being fed a bit and they're they're they're, they're hungrier than sort of typical cacti and succulents just because they grow fast so they just physically need more you know stuff to grow but they're not like um 
I don't know, they're not like tomatoes or something, you know. They kind of, kind of treat them like an average house plant with fertilizer intermittently if you can, or use some kind of slow release stuff or compost in the soil and then they'll be fine for months. <laughs> be back with Avery shortly for more Tradescantia intelligence but now it's time for question of the week which comes from Lauren and Lauren wanted to know how big saxifraga baby plants should be before they are ready to break that umbilical cord of the stolon and be potted up on their own and grown on this is a great question I mean I can't resist answering a saxifraga stolon if for a question If you're a regular listener to the show, you will know that this plant, the mother of thousands, it's sometimes called. I think it should be called the jellyfish plant because it does look a bit like a jellyfish with this rosette of hairy leaves. And then these stolons coming out, which are wire thin and droop down. And at the end of each of them is a baby plant, which start off tiny, but they can get quite large if you leave that stolon in place. They are super easy to propagate because those baby plants do root really easily. But it's a good question. At what point can they strike out on their own? The answer is it depends purely based on what kind of propagation you're going to go for. One of the easiest ways of propagating these plants, if you have room in the top of the pot, is just to loop that baby back onto the surface of the substrate of the parent plant and get a little unfolded paper clip or something to just hold down the stolon just next to the baby plant. That means that it's in contact with the soil and as a result it will start to produce roots and then once it's got a decent root system growing you can just carefully remove it from the pot you may have to take the whole mother plant out of the pot and tease it away gradually but it's very very easy to do and the plant should grow well because it's still got that connection to the parent plant which means it's still getting nutrients from that parent if you want to go for the more brutal chopping technique then it's best not to do it when the plant's absolutely tiny i mean they start off mere millimeters across and you know they can get so the leaves are about two three centimeters across uh, at their largest size I mean, I don't know how long you could keep them on the plant and what size they'd reach, but you don't want to take them off when they're absolutely minuscule because they're hard to handle and the plant just hasn't got enough in the way of resources to really survive. So wait until they're at least the size of, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something that will translate around the world. I was going to say a conker, but then I'm not sure if people outside the UK know what a conker is. I would say the leaves have got to be at least a centimetre or two across before you go for this technique and the best thing to do when you do take them off is press that plant into the top of some moist substrate and then place the whole thing in a clear plastic bag or a propagation box to give the plant a best chance of success. The other thing that's worth saying and this is a little secret about saxifrages that not everyone knows is quite often without you doing anything yourself you will find if you have a rummage around the top of the pot that there are baby plants already rooted. I'm never quite sure how this happens but oftentimes if you just look you'll find there's some baby plants already waiting to go to their new homes rooted and everything. So if that is the case for your plant it's even easier you can just make sure those little plants have got a decent root system of a few centimeters a couple of centimeters and then tease them away and pop them up this plant really does make life easy for you and if you're interested in finding out more about saxifraga stolonifera i will put a link in the show notes to an episode where i covered them in more depth as always with any propagation What you're aiming for is just to make the conditions as ideal and comfortable as possible for that plant so it can put lots of energy into root production. That's where it'll start. You probably won't notice the baby plant growing much at first. It'll be putting all its energy into those roots. So humidity reasonably high helps and also keeping that soil moist but not too moist. And just watch out for any leaves that die back 
because they can be a source of fungal infections and so on. But really, it's not that hard to get this plant to propagate. That said, don't do what I did with my tricolour, the beautiful white, pink and green Saxifragia stolonifera, and give away all the babies and then kill the parent plant. Hmm, not very clever. I now have another one, uh, so I'm good, taking very good care of that one. But it is a plant that's worth propagating regularly because it's quite short-lived. It doesn't last very long. Even the best cared for plants peter out after a few years. I hope that helps, Lauren. And if you've got a question for On The Ledge, drop me a line in the old email on the ledge podcast at gmail.com. Now let's get back to Tradescantias. There's been some controversies over the years. This goes back right back to I'm thinking of, you know, my vintage houseplant books from the 70s and 80s, where the names have changed quite a bit along the way. What? How has this happened? Is it because they all look fairly similar or is it just because they're so popular as houseplants that nurseries have been sticking different names on them without much regard for the science? It's a weird situation. It's I think it's a combination of factors. I think partly there's definitely that they all look quite similar, you know, historically, you know, growers and nurseries would kind of just label everything as Tradescantia albiflora, which is, that's now considered a synonym for Tradescantia fluminensis. But they would just kind of slap that label on any sort of greenish creeping Tradescantia. And actually, there's a bunch of species that will kind of would come under that label. But um, people mostly just kind of didn't bother to distinguish because they're all more or less the same in cultivation terms. Tradescantias, although they're very like commonly grown and widespread, hardly anyone has ever really specialized in them so it's the sort of plant where like every nursery would have like one or two cultivars in the corner that they kind of throw in with everything else but because there weren't many people that were sort of um collecting or researching the sort of genus as a whole there would be a lot of kind of everyone would just make up their own name for the plant and sometimes the same name would get used for different plants and sometimes the same plant would get given a bunch of different names by different people. That's like a lot of what my research is now trying to make a a kind of authoritative checklist of all of the cultivars that there are and what their correct names are to try and kind of clear up all of that yeah confusion that's been going on for like more than 100 years that sounds like a big task when you're doing that and you've got two different plants with different names and you're comparing them to see whether they might be the same plant what are you actually looking for it's tricky because one of the unique things about tradescantias is that they can vary their appearance so dramatically in different growing conditions so like the same plant if you grow it in low light or high light or with a lot of water or not much water it can look like as if it's a totally different species. So um, so if I have uh, two plants that I'm not sure whether they're the same or different, I grow them together in identical conditions, basically, for a long time and examine them really carefully to see if there's any way to distinguish them or if they seem to be you know, indistinguishable and then can be assumed to be the same. I see. Right. So you've actually got to grow them out and really check that they're under the same conditions. They look they look identical. And um, and presumably the flowers, I mean, I know their flowers aren't particularly exciting, but if they flower, that gives you another set of clues. It can be a clue. Yeah. Although because, like you said, they, they often they don't flower very easily, the houseplant types sometimes, and they're not generally grown for their flowers. So it means that the cultivars haven't been kind of selected for specific flowering traits. So it means that Often the flowers are just the same regardless. (laughs) So even I've got like a bunch of um, Zebrina cultivars that have clearly different foliage. You know, they're different clones. But when you compare their flowers alone, they are totally identical. So it doesn't help at all. I see. (laughs) Well, I mean, you're making this task sound absolutely enormous. uh, So (laughs) I salute you. But I want to get into some of these gnarly issues with naming. Now, quadricolour, this is the one that I think possibly on the social media, has been one of the most lively discussions. I keep seeing people selling something as quadricolour and I'm thinking, I don't think that looks like a quadricolour, but who am I to say? So what's going on with quadricolour? So the situation is in the uh, the late 1800s to the early 1900s, like around the turn of the century, there was a, a new cultivar of Tradescantia zebrina that had kind of unusual... Um, sectoral variegation so it have like random pink and white sort of bands on the leaves um and that was originally given the name 
multicolor Madame Le Queen. And then that kind of became known as sometimes as just multicolor. And then the name quadricolor came into use for that cultivar. And over the sort of 1900s, that became exclusively the, the name quadricolor was used for that plant. So it's been, it's about 100 years old now. It was kind of very popular when it first came in. And then it's become less widespread recently. And it's not, it's not grown by any sort of huge commercial wholesalers at the moment. So you, you'll get it from kind of collectors and small specialist nurseries, but you won't find it, you know, in a garden center sort of thing. Um, and then meanwhile, over about the last uh, 20 or 30, maybe 40 years, uh, a new cultivar came in that's a variegated cultivar of Tradescantia mundula, which is a kind of a small green leafed creeping one. And uh, this new cultivar has kind of pinkish cream uh, sectoral variegation, so kind of random stripes on the leaves again. And that cultivar has been given a bunch of different names to sell it. Sometimes it's called rainbow, sometimes it's called tricolor, some people just call it variegata and all kinds of other things. And one of the names that it's often sold with is quadricolor. And this cultivar is uh, produced on a huge scale by a lot of wholesalers. So it's very, very common today. So you'll find it easily in you know, garden centers, houseplant shops, it, it's everywhere. Um, and it's, it's often sold with the name Quadricolor. So we're now in this situation where the name Quadricolor originally and correctly refers to this very old, variegated Tradescantia zebrina, but it's become much, much better known as a name for this variegated Tradescantia mundula. It's, it's a big, confusing mess at this point. That is a big, confusing mess. So when you're buying quadricolor, what would you advise? Well, ultimately, you need to be able to recognise it so that you can look at the plant and know that what you're getting is what you intend to get. That's the, the kind of most important thing. You need to be able to, to identify the plant that you're looking for so that you don't have to trust the seller's ID, because basically you can never trust a seller's ID. Anytime you're buying a plant, you need to be confident that what you see is what you want, regardless of what it's being called, because that's never reliable. But yeah, if you are looking for the Zebrina quadricolor, then you'll probably need to look in places like Etsy, eBay, and um, sort of collectors, Facebook groups and things like that, where you can find individual people that are selling it. You, If you see something in a garden centre labelled as quadricolour, that's not it. Is there a sort of a killer thing where you can just look at it and go, well, that's definitely quadricolour because... Yeah, basically, that's what it is. It, it looks like a zebrina, so it's got, it's got this kind of greenish, purplish leaves with wide, two wide silver bands on each leaf. And then the quadricolour cultivar has kind of random patches of white and pink sort of overlaid over those silver stripes. So it's the silver stripes that you're looking for. That's what proves that it's a, a cultivar of Zebrina, whereas the Mundula, it's just plain green with pink stripes. So if you see plain green leaves anywhere, it's, it's not Zebrina. Right, got you. And we should say also a little plug for you that you do have, run a, a sort of a micro nursery yeah, and you do I sell. Do. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. you're selling quadricolor yeah. correctly. <laughs> <nobody else's. laughs> and I'm sure there's other there's other discussions going on and I'm sure you yeah, could fill so us in. But, I mean, yeah, there's loads more. Well, I mean, this is where, why I would refer people to your to your wonderful website for where you've got li you're updating constantly all the work that you're doing with getting a list of all these cultivars as accurately as you can how far into this yeah, project good question. are you there is an end in sight like the 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 sort of end goal is to have a complete checklist of every name that's ever been used and of every cultivar that is known to exist and of how those names link to those cultivars so that's got, that's what I'm working towards and I am chipping away at it but um it's probably going to be uh, possibly years before it's finished. I'm kind of, I'm hoping for months, but it, it's, it's hard to predict really. <laughs> we should all be glad that you're doing it because hopefully this will cut through, you know, we can refer people to your website to when these questions are happening to go, look, here is the, <laughs> here is the information. Avery's done the work. You must have, uh, given that you're growing all these plants and sort of examining them, your collection must be extensive. Are there any Tradescantia you have not managed to get hold of yet that are still on your wish list? There's one, there's one particular one that I think may be extinct from cultivation, but it's called oh. uh, Tradescantia carinthoides variegata. It's sort of, it's similar to the uh, Nanook 
but instead of having the sort of uniform stripes it's got a kind of random sectoral variegation so you know sometimes the leaf will be half and half or sometimes it will be solid green or solid white it arose in the sort of in the 50s or sometime around then and was popular for a while but then i think when nanook sort of came into popularity the variegata just kind of dropped out and it so it, it was um it was awarded at an rhs award of garden merit something like 10 or 15 years ago i think but since then it's just kind of just disappeared and i found the most recent evidence i found of it existing is a a photo from a blog in japan in 2013 and since then nothing oh wow, <laughs> oh, wow. That's a, that sounds like a good treasure hunt. I mean, I know I have I have listeners who work at Wisley and places, and probably some in Japan. So if anyone yeah. can track down this plant for Avery, <laughs> like we need to hear from you. This is it. This could be exciting. That's not a very long period of time for a plant to totally no, disappear. No, it's really surprising it? considering how recently it was. You know, popular. It was getting an RHS award. It was like a, a well-known one, and now it's just just yeah gone. That's amazing. I don't know. It's very exciting to think that one day something might happen and you might suddenly yeah, get hold of yeah. it. But <laughs> and where are you? I mean, once you've finished this project, what's next? I don't know, really. I haven't thought about it. I mean, I, I, I guess I've sort of been vaguely thinking that once I've finished the Travis Gantia genus, I will move on to other Comrenaceae genera. And they will yeah. be, in comparison, they will be a much, much smaller job. Like all of the non Tradescantia cultivars in the whole family are probably fewer than all of the Tradescantia cultivars, just because Tradescantia is the, by far the most common genus in the family. But Yeah, you've got things like Calicia, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, Calicia, um, Cyanotis, nice. um, mm. Gibasis, Tenantia, yeah. And there's there's also there's quite a bit of um, sort of mislabeling confusion among genera in the family. So like a lot of non Tradescantia plants get just labelled as Tradescantia just because that's the name people are familiar with and they kind of, they look similar. Um, so I think it would be good to sort of work on all of that in combination to try and clear up those intergeneric misunderstandings too. As, as you say, nice to take on a job that's a bit more manageable <laughs> yeah, once, yeah. You've, <laughs> once you've finished <laughs> this one. And um, I'm interested just to quickly go back uh, as somebody who uh, is interested in outdoor gardening too. You've reminded me of the outdoor Tradescantia, which I have ha had in gardens in the past. And I seem to remember being quite aggressively aggressive, if I can put it that way. Is it the, I can't remember what the species name is, the, the one with the, the strappy leaves. Do you know the one I mean? The garden cultivars are generally agreed to be a kind of a mishmash of hybrids of a couple of different native species to the um, North America. And the group are generally called the Andersoniana group. So that's okay. the name for the, the hybrid. Sometimes they used to be called Tradescantia cross Andersoniana, but it's now accepted that it's not a sort of a scientific hybrid. It's just a, a cultivar group. And of course, there will be listeners listening to this from subtropical, tropical parts of the mm. world who can grow any old Tradescantia yeah. outside, yeah. which is another thing altogether. That's the, your opportunity to then grow them as they would grow in the wild, where they'd be romping about on the ground. Yeah, and I, you know when you see pictures of them of them growing in their sort of native climate, they're just just amazing. You know the way they spread along the ground, and it's like nothing in a pot. Yeah, exactly. I mean that's so useful to to think of that illustration because I think that will help a lot of people to understand why their plant isn't thriving, or even why it might it might seem to not be thriving when actually it's probably doing fine, but it just doesn't look the way you want it to look. <laughs> Right. I guess this is the thing. People seem to be terrified of, of chopping plants, but I think with this one particularly, it's really key. It's really, really key. I sort of joke that, you know, you, you, if you want a, a nice looking Tradescantia, you just have to prune it every five seconds. You know, it's like, you just that's, that's just part of the job. But if you can sort of get on top of that sort of regular small maintenance, then they are actually really easy to keep happy. Well, thank you so much for all that wonderful information, Avery. And I'll stick various links in the show notes for people to go and check out your all the work you're doing that is brilliant to have your input and hopefully that will have cleared up some some confusion too along the way so thank you very much for joining me thank Avery. you very much for having me thank you so much to avery what a fount of knowledge and if you're a patreon subscriber you can tune into an extra leaf 91 now which contains another chunk of chat with 
Avery, where we go into another Tradescantia controversy about Nanook and discuss the finer points of ICRA and cultivar registration. There's a link for that in the show notes if you're a subscriber. That is all for this week's show. I'll be back next Friday. I'm off to the Chelsea Flower Show this coming Monday. And yes, I will be getting all houseplanty with the various houseplant exhibits therein. So check out my Instagram on Monday because I should be bombarding it with lots of nice stuff. And I'll see you next Friday for a very showy episode. Don't forget to sign up for my newsletter, The Plant Ledger, if you haven't done already. It's an absolute corker this week. Take care. Bye. The music you heard in this podcast is Roll Jordan Roll by the Joy Drops, The Road We Used to Travel When We Were Young by Komiku, and Sundown by Josh Woodward. The ad music was Dill Pickles by the Heftone Banjo Orchestra. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit the show notes for details.